Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Economic Bureau. Today, I'm joined by the boss, Greg Foss. Um, Greg, I'm very excited about today's uh, conversation with you. Uh, so thank you very much for, for taking the time uh, to join us. Well, it's a pleasure to see you again. And Daniel, uh, off screen, we were saying where we first met down in uh, El Salvador. So, uh, and that was random. It was really random. I was uh, laying in a hammock and you were there for a meeting, not, a, you were there for a finance meeting, if I recall. But anyway, it was good to meet in El Salvador and uh, nice to be on your show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was quite a funny episode. I'm like, this has got to be Greg Foss. I've got to go say I do him. So here we are today. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Greg. Awesome. Um, yeah. Greg, so may, maybe if uh, you can give us a little bit of a background of yours, uh, just so that everyone knows who, who we're talking to today. Sure. Uh, well, hi, everyone. Um, just about a 60-year-old Canadian living in Canada. I've spent my life uh, managing, I like to say managing risk. To be honest, I managed uh, credit risk as a uh, portfolio manager at a hedge fund during the great financial crisis. And then prior to that, uh, I was on the sell side of the street. So I worked for an investment dealer in both Canada and New York. Um, and I traded junk bonds. So my entire career, 30 plus years has been spent analyzing credit risk. Uh, quite honestly, uh, trying to educate people as to how to evaluate credit risk is many people are really unaware. They'll own the stock of a company, the equity of a company, but not understand where the debt of that same company trades on a relative basis. And very often the debt is giving you signals that the equity players miss. And given that the debt is a prior claim in the capital structure means it has priority of uh, payment in the event of a restructuring or a bankruptcy, uh, the equity, I would suggest, the subordinate equity claim needs to uh, to understand what the debt holders are thinking about the company. And often uh, you can set up a trade where you own the bonds and you short the equity as a hedge because the subordinate claim, uh, if the bonds aren't worth 100 cents on the dollar, the equity is worth zero. Now, there can be workout situations where the equity has some residual value, but point being very simply, uh, those two universes uh, frequently collided, but also in, in, in normal times, they, they operated in, you'd call it a parallel universe. So I've, I've spent my life uh, in that chair. Uh, I've been through four financial crises in my, in my history. It started with the Latin American debt crisis way back in uh, 1988, where I just graduated from a school in the US, but I came back to Canada and worked for Canada's largest bank. And uh, the global financial system was under duress because of the Latin American debt crisis. Uh, there was a situation where Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady had proposed a restructuring of Mexican debt. It was called the Brady Plan. This was back in the late 80s. And I worked on that project, became enamored with credit, wanted to actually buy more of the debt when it was trading at 25 cents on the dollar, but it's hard to convince a bank that's blown their brains out at hundred cents on the dollar to buy more at 25 cents on the dollar. Anyway, those bonds actually matured. Uh, they did trade as high as 120 cents on the dollar at one point, just because of interest rates and Mexican oil price. So, um, you know, that was the first crisis. The second one was uh, long-term capital management. Third one was um, the great financial crisis, 2008, 2009. That was really scary, Daniel. Um, the world was ending. Uh, we were, I was working at a hedge fund, as I mentioned. We had a lot of the trades on that, uh, uh, you know, we were, uh, we owned protection and credit was, getting just decimated, we were making money, but it just felt horrible. Like you weren't happy that you were making money. Uh, and it, it was almost weird because uh, even though we were making money, uh, some clients were redeeming us because uh, 
they they wanted to take profits. Everything else they owned was uh, getting destroyed, so they wanted to take profits and in, in, in stuff, you know. So it's 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 a really it was a really tough time. Anyway, came out of the great financial crisis with the trade that uh, I defined my career. It was a restructured asset backed commercial paper, a made in Canada problem, but a very big problem. Uh, the debt was trading in the low twenties. It got restructured, ended up maturing at par over a five year time frame. And we had done some really cool analytics on it. We were highly comfortable owning the debt. Uh, we did quite well. And so after that, uh, I decided I'm not sure how I'm going to top that in my career. And, uh, I decided to retire. There was some certain family issues and personal issues, the pressure of, of managing money for all that time. So I retired and, uh, wouldn't you know, I found Bitcoin. And when I found Bitcoin in 2016, I thought like everybody, ah, it's gotta be the Ponzi that the mainstream media says it is. But luckily I did some work. And I'm an engineer by training. Um, I went to uh, McGill University in Montreal for an engineering degree. But then I went to an MBA in finance in the United States. And I said, wow, well, finance is all mathematics. Bonds are all mathematics. Engineers are pretty good at math. This is a perfect meshing of my uh, talents. Uh, and I became a financial engineer. So remember, though, I'm visual as well. I studied mechanical engineering and luckily someone showed me the Bitcoin blockchain in action at tradeblock.com in 2016. And I'm like, what? Oh my God, this is a thing of beauty. This is absolutely beautiful. You mean you can transfer value over time and space? No intermediary. There's only 21 million of these things and you can see it in action and you can track your, 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 uh, blockchain transaction. And I was like, this is the solution to the Fiat Ponzi that I've been looking for for 30 years. Okay. Because I knew the Ponzi was always every single financial crisis is the same rescue by the central bank, print money, kick the can down the road, wait till the next financial crisis. So I mentioned the three, then the fourth one, was uh the covid crisis and that's when it's it's now mathematically certain that it is over for the you know it, the, the us dollar is debasing forever we've accumulated a debt burden that's so high it's impossible to escape that debt spiral without printing money and by the way you don't escape the debt spiral it's the only thing that solves the debt spiral is printing more money which means fiat money is 100% certain to debase, which means you need to protect yourself with hard assets. And Bitcoin is just quite simply the best hard asset that man has ever created. We can talk about that. But what I really want to you know, bring up is I always bring credit into an analysis of any uh, product that I study. And I think of Bitcoin as the anti-fiat. In other words, if you own Bitcoin, you're actually short the credit or you're short the sovereign debt of the fiat issuing or the fiat nations around the world. So think of Bitcoin as being a credit insurance on the sovereign debt of the world. And you can actually calculate an intrinsic value of Bitcoin using credit default swaps on sovereign debt. And I wrote a paper. It's what sort of got me into the Bitcoin community, endeared me to the Bitcoin community, um, that I can value using credit default swaps, an intrinsic value of Bitcoin based on open market insurance rates on sovereign debt. And uh, it's only a model. It's a model that I'm very comfortable with, but like everything, some people can agree with it. Some people can use it as a, you know, one input into their valuation metric for Bitcoin. But uh, yeah, I'm proud of that model. 
it's, uh, you know, some people are finally coming around to the, to the uh, understanding that Bitcoin is an insurance product um, and it has value. And think of it as, you know, the crazy thing is if you have fire insurance on your house and then in the, you can see in the distance that the fire, there's a fire approaching, a forest fire. Well, I see the forest fire approaching. It's the sovereign debt spiral. And the value of Bitcoin will go higher as the fire approaches the house because you don't sell fire insurance. When you see the fire coming to your house, that's the value. So anyway, that's one way of looking at Bitcoin. A little bit of a long introduction. But, uh, you know, I enjoy talking and, and, and uh, uh, pitching that narrative because credit runs the world, Daniel. It's that simple. You know it. Everybody know it, cr- knows it. Credit is the biggest asset, financial asset class in the world. And you better understand what credit is saying. And you better understand that you need protection when that credit bubble is expanding at an unsustainable pace, which is where we are right now. Yeah, and that's what I love about your uh, your you know what you bring to the table, Greg. Because you're a credit guy, you're a, a math guy, and I myself work with uh, fixed income and structured uh, credit products. So okay. when I first heard about you uh, and you laying out your thesis, I was like, "Oh man, this dude knows his stuff." Like it, I was really impressed with this model of yours. So. Like, I guess my audience has already figured out that it's going to be a technical conversation, um, which is, I love it. So I guess just, just to summarize a little bit what you said about the CDS for everyone's sake is, and correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, in short, Bitcoin could be considered a, an insurance policy on fiat debasement, an insurance policy like a CDS, a credit default swap, we're currently a credit default swap. There's a seller of the insurance. There's a buyer of the insurance. The buyer of the insurance is covering any potential losses on whatever types of via bonds uh, he's hedging. And the seller of the insurance gets a premium in the meantime. And if, you know, whatever hits the fan, then the buyer of the insurance will collect. But here's the tricky part, right? And this, this you've, you mentioned this a lot, which is, okay, everything worked if you bought that product. The thing is, will the seller of the insurance still exist if there is a systemic risk, right? And you've mentioned that a lot. Could you elaborate a little bit on that, Greg? Yeah, so perfect uh, question. Uh, That's called counterparty risk. It's like buying insurance, even life insurance from a life insurance provider that is unable to meet your policy, Uh, you know, when you die (laughs) and your family goes to claim your life insurance if the policy issuer uh or seller is not able to meet that obligation well it's a contractual default it's a uh it's it's counterparty risk now the beautiful thing about bitcoin is there is no counterparty risk bitcoin exists it's not a uh it's not an insurance company that you you have risk in a cds contract you did correctly point that out. And during the great financial crisis, some of the ugliness that happened was people who were short or who needed protection on, let's say, Bear Stearns. But they had bought that protection from Lehman Brothers. All of a sudden, they're like, "Uh uh-oh, Lehman Brothers is going bankrupt. Now I need to go and buy protection on Lehman Brothers to protect my position that I had bought from Lehman Brothers as protection on Bear Stearns. You see the circularity of it. And and that's where things get really, really ugly. And that's the credit risk contagion that exists in the market. Um, Be careful that a seller of insurance or a buyer of insurance, you don't actually have to have a credit event to occur in order for you to make money on that uh, on that insurance policy. If the premiums on that, and so let's say you buy a five year credit default swap and you have protection and you're paying this amount of premium, it's contractually uh, agreed, you're paying 
a hundred basis points a year for the next five years, let's say one year into it, that premium has increased to 200 basis points because the risk, the, the risk of that default event occurring has increased. Well, what you get is an ability, the potential to sell that contract. The default event hasn't occurred, but the 200 basis points mark to market would put that insurance policy into a positive profit position where you could turn around and then sell that insurance. Now, a lot of people do that. Uh, you know, they trade contagion risk, they trade correlation risk, uh, and they trade markets, not in order for the event of default to actually occur, but they just thought, oh, you know what? This insurance was too cheap. It's like an out of the money option. I'll buy that insurance. So it's an open market. The contracts are anywhere from five years all the way down to three months. What happened is you, the, the contract gets issued with a five-year term and then three, three months later, it's four and three quarters years and a new five years issued. But that four and three quarter year rolls down the spectrum uh, all the way to, uh, to time zero. So any default event out there has a reference asset that will be the asset that is defined as the default uh, security. But here's the cool thing. These contracts are unlimited. There's lots of counterparty risks. So that they, 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 uh, circulate the market. And the same thing happens with sovereign debt. So even though people can say the default probability of the United States is low, that is true, but it's not zero because there's actually an open market credit default swap spread that indicates the risk of default amongst uh, open market participants who are trading risk. And, you know, somebody may be, may own protection. They bought protection on Canada, let's say. And they say, well, I've bought protection on Canada and I'm going to sell protection on the United States because I want to, I'm worried about Canada, but if Canada, Canada will default before the United States. So I think I can take out a spread. You see how that can work? You're a buyer and seller of insurance and you're, tr you're, you're trading a correlation spread between two credits. So I don't want to get too technical, but this market exists. It's a very sophisticated market, requires ISDAs, which uh, are swap dealer uh, agreements, counterparty risk collateral agreements, and it's played by the big boys, the big hedge funds. But nonetheless, these open market rates are exactly that. They are uh, indications of risk real indications of risk. These aren't fake. So anyone who says there's a zero probability of default by the USA over the next five years, you can go out and collect a premium for selling that insurance to someone because someone's willing to pay you money. Now, they might say, Daniel, I love you, kid, but your counterparty risk is too high. Your credit is not good enough. But the big hedge funds that have ISDAs, well, their counterparty risk allows them to play in this market. So that's how I've, you know, got my chops. Always look at credit markets for indications. Understand that life is uh, always a probability. You play probability distributions. Risk is a probability calculation. So there's only one certainty in the financial markets that I have seen. And that is that fiat money will debase. That is absolute mathematics. So when you have 100% certainty, you need to take action to protect that certainty. And that's what Bitcoin is. You can value it using credit default swaps. That's one model. You could value it using stock to flow. I'm not a fan of that model. I need to be clear, but it doesn't matter. It's a model. And I, I've, I've, you know, had some discussions online with people. I frequently say, I will give you a price target, but not a time. 
it's it's silly to give a price target and a time. It, it's it's too, too difficult, if not impossible. Markets exist to make you look stupid, okay? That's why markets exist, to make you look stupid. So why are you going to give a target and a time? That being said, stock to flow is a model. CDS valuation of Bitcoin is a model. I have a price target based on a different type of model. All of this is nothing but going into a probability distribution of potential outcomes of the price of Bitcoin and why you should own it as insurance or as a piece of your portfolio that, uh, uh, you know, as an important component of your portfolio that hedges risks in other parts of your portfolio. In many cases, it's not non-correlated. And adding Bitcoin to any portfolio can increase portfolio returns and reduce portfolio risk. It's the beautiful asset that's created to allow everybody to manage risk more properly than they currently uh, have the tools. And I'm just dedicated to try to help people understand that. Yes. And and when you say, Greg, I, it's very interesting that you say that. The odds of uh, debasement are 100%. Because I think it, it, it can be summed up in the following manner. Debt can be approached in the following ways. You could try to reduce debt by either austerity measures, which won't get politicians reelected. Mm -hmm. You could increase taxes, again, not getting reelected. Now, you that, could, not only that, though, yeah. let's, be, let's hit that one. You can argue that we've hit the point of diminishing marginal returns in taxes where if they raise taxes any farther, tax revenue actually decreases because more pe more of the economy goes underground, right? And we've seen that historically where you try and increase taxes too much and everyone's just like, okay, well, I'm not going to declare my revenue or whatever. Um, okay, so that's, that's a point there. But yes, you can increase taxes, but you got to be very careful if you hit the, the point of diminishing marginal returns. Spot on, like spot on. I come from a Latin American country, so I'm quite aware of, of those dynamics. Okay. Um, I guess the third option would be an outright default, which is obviously not something good for anyone. Well, look, that'll, that would cause so much calamity in the world, and I'm yes. not rooting for it. Let me be very clear. Anybody who's rooting for the U.S. to default on their debt, I don't believe they quite understand the consequences. Uh what debasement really is, is not a hard default. It's actually a soft default, right? Daniel, someone lends you money for 10 years, yet lends the U.S. Treasury money for 10 years. You're highly likely, but not certain, highly likely to get your money back. And you've earned a coupon. That's what a fixed income contract is, a fixed coupon. But in 10 years time, what's the value of the $100 that you lent at time zero? It's certainly less than $100 in purchasing power. Now, you may say, well, I earned this coupon over the 10-year period. The reality is that coupon is not sufficient to keep pace with the debasement of the currency. So, um, oh, sorry. So basically, um, you got to remember that you have hard defaults and soft defaults. And... The printing of money is basically a soft default event. Yeah, I'm with you. And and I've always said that option four, which is the one that I was missing, was printing money. And uh, Ray Dalio even says that that's the one that politicians will always choose, not only because people like receiving money, number one, but they don't fully understand what the basement is right Correct. people understand what inflation is because it hits your wallet directly but the basement that flies below the radar in my opinion um so ha having said that greg what are you surprised at all that uh you know the us got downgraded let, let me let not me, at all not here. at all no? like let's be clear uh if the us okay so <clears throat> there's certain credit metrics that are well understood in the markets um for corporate credits uh from triple a rating all the way down to triple c rating the the metric that i love to 
focus on. And in fact, I had a paper that was published in the Financial Analyst Journal on this back in the 1990s was EBITDA to interest expense. Now, EBITDA interest expense is basically pre-tax ca cash flow, EBITDA, earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization. You take that pre-tax cash flow and you divide it by your interest obligation and it gives you a ratio of how much cash flow you have to pay your interest obligations on your debt. And as you can appreciate, if you go from AAA, the number was like historically around 10 times. You had 10 times the amount of cash flow to pay your interest expense. If you go all the way down to triple C, you're dealing with companies at triple C that have about one turn, which means there's no error. You're only making enough cash flow to pay your interest expense. If you have to roll your debt over <clears throat> to uh, ensure that you don't default on your principal obligation, uh, that's called a zombie company when it gets to be less than one times interest. Uh, cash flow to interest expense. Well, where are we as a country? We're less than, when I say we, the USA, but Canada the same, we're less than one turn. We don't even have enough tax revenues after what I would call your fixed cost obligations, which include military spending and entitlements. Once you subtract out those fixed, those, those fixed obligations from your cash flow, the amount left over to pay the interest is less than the amount of interest that is accumulating on the debt. That's the definition of a debt spiral. If the USA was a company that had the same credit metrics as the USA, it would be rated triple C. Wow. Now, what does the USA have that a company does not have? It has the ability to print money. And therein is the secret sauce that allows this Fiat Ponzi to continue. So am I surprised it was downgraded? No, I'm surprised it took them so long to figure out that it should be downgraded. But uh, S&P did it 12 years ago. And it's only one notch below AAA, the gilt edged or pristine. It's double A plus now. The reality is, in my opinion, it should be fur way further down the credit spectrum. Um, to the point where I'd argue, you know, probably a triple B type of credit rating, even though it's interest expenses way worse or cash flow to interest expenses way worse. You have to be careful or you have to acknowledge the ability to print money. The question happens, when do people stop accepting that printed money as payment for their old debt? You've seen it happen in Venezuela, but you also seen it happen in G20 countries like Argentina, where they've defaulted four times. Now they restructure and they continue to uh, go down the path of, uh, you know, well, believe us this time, we're not going to default this next time. The debt markets are crazy, right? Like it's just, okay, forgive and forget. Okay, now let's, let's try it again. So, um, but see, that's reflected in a credit spread and that the, the premium that they pay over, you know, let's say that Argentina issued U.S. dollar denominated debt. There'd be a spread between the U.S. Treasury and the amount that uh, Argentina has to pay on their U.S. dollar denominated debt. And that credit spread compensates you for the increased default risk. So that's how credit markets work. Um you need to understand the difference between a hard default and a soft default. You need to understand credit uh, metrics that evaluate credit risk. So yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's I, what credit markets do. I, I agree with you, and and I guess you know, putting Bitcoin into the the conversation, if someone in Argentina, one of these countries, would have owned a bit of Bitcoin, I'm not saying 100% of the savings in Bitcoin, a bit of Bitcoin, their fiat, a part of their borrowing of their savings would have been annihilated. 
right? Because of the effects movement and, you know, currency tanks and loses absolute its value. But the portion in, in Bitcoin would have at least uh, compensated. Yes. Yes. More than compensated, actually, for, for well, what they lost. Well, you look at Lebanon. You look at, at the price of Bitcoin in Lebanese, uh, not sure how that, what they call their currency, but in Lebanese fiat, the price of Bitcoin hits new all-time highs. Same with Turkish lira, right? So you just have to understand the, yeah, there's yeah. currency in plaques. There's uh, one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, but Bitcoin measured in U.S. dollars will have the same impact as the the cross currency rate for uh turkish lira versus us dollars and and that's why bitcoin's beautiful it's a uh you know it's agnostic to the measuring stick one bitcoin it's, equals one bitcoin that's the measuring stick yeah sure and and we can always count on the spray and pray um technique of all central banks that's well, yeah, it's it's spray good. and pray. I love it. I haven't heard that one, but it's extend and pretend. It's the same thing. Excellent. Extend and pretend, spray and pray. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Here, Greg. Now, I have a few questions um, that have always, like, I, I, I got to admit to the audience, I'm, I'm pro BTC, uh, pro Bitcoin. I'm not a Bitcoin maxi, and I clash heads a lot uh, when talking to friends of mine that, that are. But I've got a few questions that I've never, you know, gotten a really good answer to regarding Bitcoin. One of them, for example, I heard you talk about the adoption of Bitcoin. Let me ask you this, Greg. If in 10 years time, the adoption rate is similar to what we have now and the market cap is similar to we, what we have now, does Bitcoin become some sort of a hobby instead of what it's meant to be or, or the potential that it has to be? Uh, a good friend of mine always asked me this, and I've got no good answer to that. Um, yeah, it's going to depend upon adoption. Um, but what, what does adoption mean? Adoption happens in many different ways. Is it being adopted because it's, it's the perfect store of value, your store of your time and energy? Is it being adopted because more merchants are accepting it as a payment uh, um method is it being adopted because remittances because sending money via western union is subject to very high fees and uh and you can do it with a bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer lightning wallet with essentially zero fees uh if you look at the adoption curves of bitcoin it's exceeding internet adoption it's exceeding cell phone adoption at the same point in those technolo technologies, because that's what Bitcoin is, it's a technology. Um, if you were to tell me it's gonna stop on a dime, I would say, yeah, it's possible it'll stop on a dime. And then it maybe became a it becomes a hobby. But for me, it's the perfect form of insurance. So why would the perfect form of insurance stop on a dime? What you yeah, know for sure is yeah. that fiat is debasing. Again, I gave you 100% certainty that fiat's debasing. Yeah. What is your protection? Well, you're going to say, I'm going to go into another digital asset. Okay. It only has 10 million coins, but the only people trading it are Daniel and Foss. There's no security in that network, whereas Bitcoin has the most secure computer network in the world. So... Is it, is it likely that the adoption continues? Yes. Is it certain? No. The only certainty is fiat debasement. Everything else is uncertain. Yeah. But if you know the fiat debasement with certainty and the best tool to protect against that is Bitcoin, well, that's how you formulate a probability distribution that says you better own more than zero Bitcoin. Okay. I don't care how much you own. But if you own zero, that is the wrong amount. Yeah. You got to own more than zero. You said you're not a Bitcoin maxi. I'm not even sure how you would define a Bitcoin maxi. If you define a Bitcoin maxi as owning only 100% Bitcoin and nothing else, then I'm not a Bitcoin maxi. If you own other digital assets, okay. I'm not telling you you should, by the way. I like Bitcoin as a digital asset that's decentralized and protects against the fiat Ponzi. No other digital asset does that. You're yeah. allowed to own it, though. You can do whatever you want with other digital assets. 
as long as you understand their likely securities and if they're proof of stake, well, they're centralized. Bitcoin is the best protection against the fiat Ponzi that I have seen. That's why I own more than zero, but I'm not 100% in Bitcoin. I We own some real estate. I'm invested in some companies like Ibex in the ecosystem. I own some stocks. I don't own bonds, but at the end of the day, it's all part of putting together a balanced portfolio of risk versus return. Yeah, yeah. And and let me rephrase, I guess. Uh, what the adoption that I meant was in terms of market cap, right? It's it's not the same thing Bitcoin at, at 50 bill versus Bitcoin at 1 trillion of, of market cap, okay. right? If the market cap remains steady for like decades, then that's where I start to think, man, even if it's like the perfect hedge and all the things okay. you mentioned. If it does, then it, you know, that, that is your measure of your, of your, um, uh, you're measuring it against fiat, which is fair. But if you measure it as one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, um, my opinion, it's an, only an opinion. Tell me in the event that Bitcoin hasn't moved, where's the stock market? Is the stock market the same or lower? Where are global debt? I know it's going to be higher, but people, are they still funding global debt? All of these outcomes, you can't look at Bitcoin in isolation. You'd have to ask where all the other assets are under a scenario where Bitcoin market cap is still 500 billion. What about the equity market cap though? Has it fallen by 80%? Like these are possibilities. These are some of the things. So I think ice asking that question in isolation is is difficult. That is a very fair fair point, uh, Greg. Uh, point taken. Um, yeah, it, the financial markets are a relative relative game, right? So you're spot on on that. Um, he, here's another question that that I have, uh, Greg. So let's pretend everyone's in a in a Bitcoin world, right? Let, 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 let's let's pretend we live all of a sudden in a hyper Bitcoinized. Uh, world, right? Okay. The Bitcoin hardcore Bitcoiners uh, currently they they critique the centralized um, feature yes. of the current financial system, right? Yes. But in a Bitcoin world, don't the Black Rocks or the sailors of 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 the world don't do? Are, are they not going to do the same thing that currently banks and asset managers and pension funds do? They're going to own vast amounts of Bitcoin, and they'll be the one potentially in a in a lending uh, scenario that could be the would hold the inventories of, of Bitcoin and set rates. It, it, well, let's let's be careful. First of all, Sailor is uh, an incredibly smart man, but how much Bitcoin does he own? Like one hundred and fifty thousand or something like that. Look, there's twenty one million of them. Okay, um, sure. He's not controlling. And then you have to worry about all, you don't have to worry. The fact is there's nodes and everything that they control the, uh, uh, the protocol. But um, BlackRock is buying Bitcoin on behalf of clients. It's not like BlackRock, this institution has $7 trillion or $10 trillion itself. That's all client money. BlackRock exists to take a fee off of that client money, but it's not like they have... $10 trillion. My God, Apple itself, the most valuable company in the world is only worth 3 trillion. It's not like BlackRock is worth 10 trillion. You guys got to understand the difference between an asset manager and the clients that actually own the assets. Okay. So I'm not that concerned. Um, it's part of the financial machine. Um, I think it's good for adoption. I actually do believe not your keys, not your coins, but it's a process. People get onboarded in different ways. Ultimately, they may find them their, their way to this self-custody. But I promise you, there's many treasurers and many corporate uh, or, or pension allocators that are going to be very comfortable buying Bitcoin through BlackRock rather than doing their own self-custody with multi-sig wallets as their first trade in Bitcoin. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an adoption process, Daniel. Um, I'm not that concerned about it, but that's because the protocol 
is decentralized. Will there be large players and concentration of large amounts of Bitcoin? There always has been, and yes, there probably always will be. But that's what makes a market. Doesn't mean that protocol is at risk. Yeah, just my, understood. Just my two sats. How about Your that? Your two sats. No, I, I I totally get it, and and I I'm with you. I think uh, institutional adoption is key to um, getting uh, Bitcoin uh, to where it should be in terms of market market cap, and also reducing the volatility of the spot. Right, that volatility ultimately hurts a lot of the That's um, retail uh, people who own the Bitcoin and do yeah. remittances and yeah. buy tacos and stuff with it. Right, so. I agree. I agree with you. But it's only 14 uh, years old. Let's let's be careful as well. Right. I mean, it's, you know, again, this is such a new technology. We're so early still. That is that is that is true. That is true. So we'll have to give it some time so far. So good, uh, I'd say. Um, and it's only getting uh, better, in, in my opinion. Um, yeah. So, Greg, um, I think uh, la last question here. Um, would you like in a in a let's say people are, are listening to this and they're saying okay well greg makes a, a good point in terms of asset allocation i think this is a difficult question but do you know like what is the percentage that people should uh think about when deciding how much to allocate to an asset such as uh bitcoin it's a great question so each individual investor has a different risk profile or a risk tolerance level so I'll start with this. The wrong allocation is zero. Anything more than zero is the right allocation. But if you put 1% of your portfolio, your net worth in Bitcoin, and you're waking up at night focusing on that 1% and not focusing on the other 99%, you're managing risk wrong because that 1% is, first of all, one of $100. You have 99 other dollars elsewhere that most likely are much higher risk, in my opinion, not price volatility, but much higher risk. I think Bitcoin is the best asymmetric opportunity I've seen in my 30 years of managing risk, which means you don't have to own 100%. But I would argue, hey, own 5%. My God, 5%. It means you have $95 or 95% of your other portfolio in other stuff that is dangerous as well. If you have bonds, you've just been sent to the, to the woodshed. You've been creamed. The bonds have been destroyed in the last three years. So it, it's a, it's a question of comfort, but let's run through some mathematics. Okay. I, I think your listeners hopefully appreciate mathematics. So I, uh, I mentioned that I calculate the intrinsic value of Bitcoin using credit default swap spreads. And that's a dynamic intrinsic value calculation. And that calculation says Bitcoin is worth about 250,000 US dollars the last time I ran it per Bitcoin. So it's trading at one tenth of its intrinsic value compared to credit default swap. So it's cheap on that metric. But here's another way that I set a price target, not a time and target, just a price target on Bitcoin. The total global financial assets in the world are 900 trillion US dollars. Okay, 900 trillion, that includes 400 trillion of debt, 300 trillion of global real estate. Okay, that's 700 trillion, 100 trillion of global equities, and 100 trillion of other assets like commodities, currencies, gold, fine art, it's all in there. So four, 400, 300, 100, 100. That's 900 trillion US dollars of global financial assets. Notice that debt is the biggest one. And I'm saying this, I believe that Bitcoin is the apex predator, which means Bitcoin will capture a portion of all those financial assets, not 100%. But I'm going to say it captures 5%. Subjective, but that's an opinion, 5%. Well, what's 5% of 900 trillion in today's dollars? 5% of 900 trillion is 45 trillion 
US dollars. What is 45 trillion divided by 21 million? That's the fixed supply of Bitcoin. And yes, some Bitcoin coins have been lost, but it doesn't matter. Let's use the total supply, 21 million. It's over 2 million US dollars per Bitcoin. If Bitcoin captures 5% of the total addressable market in today's dollar. So at 5% penetration, Bitcoin's worth over 2 million US dollars. Today's dollars, again, not in 20 years, in today's dollars, Bitcoin's worth over 2 million per Bitcoin. It's trading at 30,000, which is saying that the market is giving me a one and a half percent chance that my price target is right. One and a half percent, right? One and a half percent times 2 million equals 30,000. That's where Bitcoin is trading today. Now, I'm not 100% certain that my price target in Bitcoin will be attained, but I'm way more certain than 1.5%. Daniel, that's expected value calculations. So, you don't need to own 100%. You should own more than, or you have to own more than zero in my opinion, but... You don't need to own 100%. Where's the right answer? Depends your age, your family obligations, everything. Okay? But what is the truth? It's a probability distribution. It could go higher than 2 million, but let's just use a binary outcome. It's either worth zero or it's worth 2 million. How confident am I of my price target? I'm at least 50% confident. Which means if Bitcoin is trading at less than a million dollars per Bitcoin, I think it's cheap. Wow, dude, you're an idiot. No, no, I'm just doing mathematics and it's my opinion and that's fine. And if you don't agree with that math, do your own mathematics. No, no, you you know what I like about these, uh, this model of yours? I like how you walk us through the logic behind it one thing i cannot stand and it's very common out there in terms of when discussing bitcoin is bitcoin is going to be worth x trust me bro right so yeah, I that that i i, I just I, you know i okay, can't accept fine. that but people you 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 got to do mathematics mathematics exactly. is the base layer of language it has to be a probability and an expected value and that's exactly. all there is to it. And that's why I enjoy uh, reading your analysis and following your, your logics when, when you post them online. Uh, Greg. All right, brother. Thank you. You know what? I mean, look, it's only, it's my opinion. I've spent a lot of time managing risk. Risk is a probability distribution. It's a continuous distribution of outcomes in a shape of a bell curve many times, not always, but I believe Bitcoin to be the best asymmetric return opportunity I've ever seen. It's trading super, super cheap as insurance, but it's also trading super, super cheap as the apex predator in the global financial marketplace. Okay. Pick and choose what your proper allocation is. But if you own zero, I don't think you've done mathematics. And if you do own zero, and you still believe in the Fiat Ponzi, I'm afraid there's no hope for you, okay? Because you failed grade 11 math. <laughs> you failed grade 11 math. And I know a lot of people fail grade 11 math, so that's unfortunate. <laughs> but try and study mathematics and expected value and probabilities and et cetera. Ah, uh, nice. Nicely laid out. Thank you, Craig. Uh, and on that note, um, let's wrap up and, uh, you want to tell people where they can find you, Greg? Sure. Um, I, I've sort of developed a bit of a Twitter presence, but, uh, my Twitter handles at Foss, Greg Foss. I try and attend, uh, various Bitcoin meetups and functions. So, um, you know, I'm going to be going, I'm planning to go to Madeira, which is close to Madrid, uh, in March of next year. I've been to that Island once already. And, uh, wow, it's beautiful. Um, and it's, you know, got a president who understands Bitcoin 
Um, I will say that uh, Bitcoin gives me hope. I'm a huge fan of Michael Saylor's. I don't have his guts. Like he, that man has conviction and you know, that's cool. But somewhere between a sailor and myself, we've all spent time in risk markets. Please do your homework for your kids. It's not about you. I'm 60 years old. I own Bitcoin for my kids. And well, that's one of my Twitter things for the kids, okay? Because I believe that central bankers are irresponsible and they're pulling forward gains, future gains. They're pulling them forward to the here and now to keep politicians in power or to give universal basic income. There's, there's costs to that. And those costs accrue to our children. And that's why it's very selfish. So I'm just trying to pitch the narrative come on guys it's time to be accountable bitcoin is the most beautiful ledger that ensures accountability uh, that's why i love it i appreciate being on your podcast daniel it's so funny that i had no idea that that's how we first met was down in el salvador but man am i happy that i know who you are now so <laughs> Let's uh, let's uh, keep talking and uh, keep keep up the good work. Thanks for everything you do. Thank you for your time, Greg. It's been a pleasure. I'll talk to Thanks you soon, Alexa. my friend. Have bye a good bye. One. Bye.